Welcome back, pet parents. Today we're doing something a little bit different because we all need help. We all need a lot of help. I know I need a lot of help. And we're I'm talking to a guest today who has been on the podcast before, but we're going to talk about something totally different because we all, first of all, shopping small is really important to me. And it's really important for me to get that message across to you. Walking into a big box store versus walking into like a small indie pet store is a very different feel. And if you have never experienced that, it's actually pretty amazing. And I want to talk a little bit about that with you today. But I also know that we all somehow end up with these supplement graveyards. It's a thing. I wish it weren't a thing. I have mine. You probably have yours. And so today's guest is going to help us figure out um, her selection process and help you understand possibly a little bit more what to look for, reading labels, all the things. I think this is going to be really fun and educational for you today and probably something you will want to bookmark and come back to. So um, really quickly, if this is your first time listening to the podcast, thank you so much for being here. My name is Jessica. I'm a canine nutritionist, pet health coach, and positive reinforcement dog trainer. And on this podcast, we talk about everything pet health, quality of life, giving your pets the best life possible, knowing better let you do better. So with that, thank you so much for being here today. Krista Fox is with um, Pug and Hound Pet Apothecary uh, out of, are you, you're in Geneva, right? Yep. You're not quite, well, is it like a suburb of Chicago or? Yeah, it's, it's about like 45 minutes west of, of downtown Chicago. So um, I have had you, I actually had you and your husband, Jeff, on the podcast previously. So, or we've, just have you today, which I think is so fun um, to be able to just like focus one on one. And if you wouldn't mind kind of for anybody new listening, can you remind people a little bit about who you are and what Pug and Hound is all about? So um, I have a lot of jobs other than owning this store, but uh, that's the reason I have my store. So I am a veterinary technician at two different practices. Um, I focus at the main main practice at as a surgical technician and then at another holistic uh, practice as a chiropractic assistant and technician there. Um, I also manage a chiropractic neurologist office for people and animals um, and I help write blogs for CBD dog health and then I have my store. Um, this all feeds into helping people at my store, like you said, learn better and do better. Uh, my store focuses heavily on supplementation um, cause that's really my passion. I kind of fell into the supplement world, you know, like most of us, like, Oh, let me try this out. And it worked and I got like really into it. So I felt like a lot, there's a lot of supplements out there and there's not a whole lot of knowledge behind them where, you know, you just see a label and you go, okay, I think this is for digestion, but these ingredients do a lot more than what it might say on the bottle. So and in some cases, there are supplements that you can't use long term. So we're all here. Um, my staff is almost entirely vet techs on staff. There's always a vet tech on staff. but um, So we can help you match your dog's medical needs to an alternative solution or an integrative solution. We're obviously all vet techs here, so it's not like we're anti-conventional medicine. We all work in practices that use conventional medicine. But there's a time and a place for conventional medicine. And that's usually in more severe cases, whereas a lot of conventional vets are over-prescribing antibiotics, steroids, Apoquil, Cytopoint, without really looking at the root cause. So that's what we're all about here. Um, we really focus heavily on uh, fresh food. So that's the foundation. And honestly, kind of sucks because a lot of times we get people's dogs on better food and they don't need all the supplements. But supplements are still really critical for um, helping balance out, like, you know, imbalances within the body, achieving homeostasis, helping with, you know, various disease conditions. So that's what Pug and Hound is all about. Um, and that's what we will always be about. But um, our standards are pretty high. So I think that's part of the reason we're going to talk today is, you know, learning how to make better decisions when it comes to picking supplements. And that's what I'm all about. <laughs> yeah. And I think one of the things you just said is is so important because I focus very heavily on food first as well. Um, I believe food can be medicine. And I also think that 
we can use various foods and herbs and plants and mushrooms and all of the things that nature provides us as supplementation. Like, even though, I, so probably like kind of talking a little bit about what we mean when we say supplements, because I think there there's, there's a huge range and we'll get into all of that. Um, but so I, maybe we'll start with choosing foods for your store first, because I think that is absolutely something people need to learn and want to hear more about. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. Whereas I, as much as I love to use food as medicine and um, focus on food first, they these foods that you know companies make, whether they're big companies or small companies, they're making them for the the populace, right? They're making them for every animal out there, and we need to be managing the individual animal in front of us. So that's where supplementation is really, really key. Um, so let's start with food because you, you have a brick and mortar store, which is absolutely fabulous. Like I am just in love. I think in another life, maybe I would be an Indian pet store owner. I absolutely uh, love, 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 love them. It's like when you're a little kid and you walk into a candy store, right? You have this like, oh my gosh, feel like that's how I feel when I walk into an indie pet store. And that is so silly. I get it. But like, that's how I feel. No, so, that makes me because that's, that's when I walk into my store, I'm like, God, if I didn't own this place, I would be here every day. <laughs> right. It's so cool and so neat. And I love like, if I'm just, I just happen to be in a store and somebody's looking at something and I'm like, you know, that does X, Y, Z. And they're like, really? I'm like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love when my customers chime in, especially when I'm like talking to a customer about a product they might be reluctant about, like say CBD, and people mm -hmm. are like, oh my god, this changed my dog's life. So yeah, the the customer feedback and the, those those customer relationships are just everything to us. Our customers are we're we're very close to our customers. We spend a lot of time with our customers, so mm -hmm. they become like family, them and their pets. Well, you play a very important role in. Um a pet parent's life because I talk a lot about creating um, like you are the the manager uh, and you create a team for helping you with your pets and having an independent pet store that has staff that you can talk to and trust is a really important part of that team. Um, so, but food is the foundation of everything, as you've already said. So yeah. when you are looking at foods, do you, so I know you have a huge freezer section um, and that you also sell freeze dried. Do you have, do you have any other dry foods options or how do you um, look at that? Because like, like you said, um, you know, it's, it's important to build relationships with people and you have to meet people where they're at. Mm -hmm. Like I, you know, in a dream world, I'd love to be an only raw store, but yeah. I have to be realistic with people and give them the best options I can. So that being said, I do carry two brands of kibble, but um, food rules in my in my store. Um, first and foremost, I don't believe in synthetic vitamin and mineral packs from China. I don't I don't like that for a lot of reasons. So I only carry two brands of kibble because they're the only two brands of kibble that don't use synthetics. So that's Carnivore and Nature's Logic. Um, I'm, I don't beat around the bush with customers when it comes to kibble. I mean, Carnivore is kind of in its own class in terms of how it's made and its its quality. But kibble, kibble is kibble. It's, it's, you know, our, our waste from our human food products. So I'm not going to tell anybody that this is, you know, going to be life changing. For example, I had a customer whose boxer really needs to be on fresh food. And I was like, look, you can switch to a better kibble, but this is still the best of the worst. I don't, I don't believe a dry food diet is appropriate for our dogs, but that all comes in a way that we deliver that with kindness and not mm -hmm. like judgmental attitude because I mean, I fed my, my dog, Bruce, who's my life. The reason I have the store, I fed him Purina one when I first got him. Cause that's what the breeder told me. And I did the wrong thing. So we all come from a place of humility and we need to make that known when we talk to customers, because a lot of people can feel overwhelmed or pressured or just overall judged like they're bad, they're bad dog parents. And that's not the case. So yes, I do carry dry food. I carry predominantly raw, um, we moved to our new location about two months ago. 
because we had a huge walk-in freezer installed so that we could offer more fresh food options. And again, all those fresh food options come with the same same standards. Um, I kind of grill all the companies that want to be in my store um, in terms of not only, you know, whether or not they use synthetics, that's something I can figure out on my own, but um, how they raise their animals, who's formulating their food, um, what types of fish oil they're using, if they have fish oil in the food, because that's another yucky supplement disaster for the most part. So um, really grilling these companies and making sure they're doing the right thing, that's really important because fresh food isn't expensive and there's a lot of companies out there charging an arm and a leg that I don't think are really deserving of that money considering what they're putting in the food. So we're very strict about what we bring in because again, we deal with mostly dogs with medical concerns. So I'm not going to put something in my store that would be a bad fit for a dog with cancer, or epilepsy, autoimmune disease, thyroid disease, you name it. I want everything in my store to be a good fit. Now, of course, that comes with some stipulations. You know, there's energetics involved in certain things, but I don't want a customer to pick up something and be like, oh, no, that would be really bad for your dog with this, where in my store, everything is clean. Everything is selected in a way that ensures you don't have any fear with what you're buying. I know the term fear-free is used a lot. I kind of use it in a different way so that my mm -hmm. customers are not scared that what they're picking up off the shelf might not be a good fit for their dog. So if I won't give it to my own dog, it's not going to be in the store. I've kicked plenty of brands out for, you know, changing things, being shady about things. Um, it's just not something I tolerate. And again, if I won't give it to my dogs, then it's got to go. One of the things I, I talked to BC Henshin not too long ago, and this came up and I just want to mention it because you just brought it up. When you are a store owner and you decide that something that is on your shelf is no longer going to be on your shelf. That's a hard decision for a store owner to make. And especially if it's like he was talking about at one point, they had a kibble that was their number one seller and he had to make the hard decision to say, no, I'm not That's carrying you with, us with, uh, with answers. So um, we sold answers. We're a huge answers store. That was our number one source of revenue. Um, and I worked for answers in their customer service department. Um, up until the point that they changed ownership. And Jeff and I agonized about it, but in the end, our our integrity was what was important. And we knew that we had customers who understood, you know, why we do what we do. And fortunately, 99% of them understood when we explained why we weren't carrying the food, why we didn't trust it anymore. They trusted us to help them get on a different food. So yeah, those decisions are hard. We've had to make them a couple of times with, with companies and it's it's brutal, but it's necessary and it's necessary especially to build trust with your customer base like you can't just sell what sells like everybody can do that big box stores can do that everything's going to be in a big box store eventually so what's important is maintaining that relationship of trust understanding compassionate care where you're actually looking at the person in front of you as a person and a dog owner and not just a company. yeah so uh, you said sourcing of um the raw materials, not using synthetic vitamin and mineral packs, um, being able to have really close communication and even relationship with the brands uh, that, that you carry in your store. I think these are all things that make indie pet stores like the place to shop because I, I see, I mean, we all have busy lives. You know, people have kids, people have things going on in their lives, their own careers, and spending all of your time trying to figure out what pet food to buy for your dog or your cat. I mean, that's, it's like a full-time job sometimes it feels like. So um, what you do to vet all of these foods, that's one of the, the things that I wanted to highlight about shopping at these small independent pet stores is that the as you were saying, these people are your connection. They are, they're where you should be getting your education. Um, I mean, social media is great, right? But there's a lot of back and forth and, um, and people, people are paid. Dis these disagree. They're often paid. So you have to take that yeah. into account. Like, uh, if they're yeah. pushing the product pretty hard and every other post is about the same product, odds are they're getting paid by that company. And that's not to say, that there aren't influencers that are selective about that. There mm -hmm. definitely are. Um, but 
you have to be careful with social media. I mean, especially now with AI, like there's just tricks all over the place in terms of marketing and saying the right things. And that's a huge reason why I do what I do and why I make it my full-time job to do this, because there's a lot of crap to sort through. There's a lot of just claims. Like, I've looked at so many products on the front and been like, oh my God, this looks great. I turn it over and I look at the ingredients. And I'm like, wow, that was a total yeah. dupe. Like this, this is not good for anybody. So yeah, it's, it, it gets really muddy. So I, I mean, I do think that indies are the place to go because this is their, their whole life, their whole job. That's what they're passionate about. We certainly don't do it for the money. We do it for seeing pets thrive and do better. So those are the people to put your trust in where everything else is kind of eh, not so sure what you're going to get yeah. on the internet. No, it it is it is really garlic is toxic to dogs. So oh, I know, <laughs> I know, I know. It's it's, but it, you know, I mean, it is what it. it when you have huge um, organizations like the ASPCA still, you know, saying it on their website, of course people believe it. Of course people believe it. It's really frustrating. People are like, well, why would they say this? Like, I mean, yeah. it's, it's uh, yeah, a lot of nonsense to go through. But I mean, I'm. I love it because, you know, I do this and it's a lot of work, a lot of reading, a lot of time I spend going through this stuff. But when you introduce a product, you try it out yourself, then your customers try it and it works and it helps their dogs do better. That's the best feeling in the world. Like it literally never gets old when a customer comes in and tells me how much something has helped their dog. That is the whole reason that we do what we do. I mean, <laughs> not to mention that vet techs also get paid garbage. So we clearly do what we do because we love pets. That's what it's all about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a vet I follow on Instagram that generally comes to super zoo as well. He posted a reel the other day where he was like a list of all of the people going into veterinary medicine for the money. And, it, and then he was just like, there was no list, right? And of course, I, I commented and I was like, I mean, you could have at least listed Zoetis, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, and that's and that's the yeah. thing. That's if people and that's a huge reason. I mean, I, I started out working in the pet food, you know, retail industry and then I became a tech. So it's interesting because you really can see things from the inside about mm -hmm. how things are skewed where these vets are just being taken advantage of, um, where they're getting most of their information from a sales rep. And that's that's seriously a problem. Mm -hmm. And it's a problem that's widespread. I mean, most of the information vets are giving their clients about medication is coming directly from a sales rep rather than that vet ask, actually researching that medication, understanding how it works, and really you know raising an eyebrow. I'll never forget the first clinic I worked in was a very conventional clinic and uh, they brought in Cytopoint and that was right when it came out. They're like, yeah, no side effects. I'm like, you're really believing that, that there's no side effects to this medication. Yeah. There's side effects to everything. Like mm -hmm. literally every substance can have a side effect. And you're telling me that this, it, it, but then of course we know that the general population becomes the test subject for long-term safety data. And we know Cytopoint comes with plenty of side effects and, and harm. So mm -hmm. Again, they're just fed information, trusting the sales rep, which I don't know why anybody would trust a sales rep. Like it's their vested interest to sell you this when we have posters on, you know, a refrigerator where we mark off how many years, your supply of heart guard we get. And the more we get, we get a free cocktail party or we get a free lunch. Like these things are built in and this is basic psychology in sales, but vets are empathetic, loving, passionate people. I do not believe vets have any intent to harm their patients. They don't. But if they don't know better, it's very hard for them to, to look past this. If that's what, you know, their mentor, their clinic owner has been doing, then they think that's the behavior you do. You listen to the reps and you feed that information to clients. But once you get, get in the inside of the vet world, you quickly realize that this is a lot of marketing and sales that has very little to do with pets overall health and more to do with band-aiding symptoms. Oh, absolutely. Um, so before we move on away from food, I just, I don't love synthetic vitamins and minerals either, but can you tell me or tell the listeners a little bit about why that's something you want to look for? Why it's something that you don't want to see in the food? So the reason I say vitamin packs is because there, there are some, some stipulations. It's not, it's not perfectly black and white. If a company 
a kibble company more so as the people that do this to, to balance out their recipes easily. They get vitamin and mineral packs from China. It is their due diligence as a company to test those vitamin and mineral packs when they get them to make sure that what is in them is what is said that is in them. Oftentimes that doesn't happen. That's why it's the number two reason for recall, recalls nationwide with kibble is vitamin and mineral toxicity. We see this over and over again because the companies aren't testing it. Now, if a company is getting individual vitamins, I mean, one of the best foods out there, Raw Bistro, has a couple synthetics in there to balance out their formula. Dr. Becker formulated that formula. But those synthetics are hand-selected individual synthetics that are tested, vetted. They come from usually Europe or the USA. Um, and they do their due diligence in terms of actually making sure those things are what they are. That's why you've never seen a vitamin and mineral toxicity recall for raw bistro or pretty much any any raw pet food company because most of the time they do um, test them individually. Now, there are companies that use packs for sure. But to answer your question, why I don't like synthetics. Synthetics, let's just say ascorbic acid, for example. We consider that vitamin C. But that's like calling the steering wheel of a car the car. It's just a part. Vitamin C is a is a, a molecule that takes many little parts, and ascorbic acid is kind of the shell. So that's that's going to cause long term vitamin and mineral deficiencies. In addition to the fact that the body doesn't process those the same as it would a whole food. I mean, they did a study on people with one a day vitamins, where someone taking one a day vitamins long term actually ended up with vitamin and mineral deficiencies because these synthetic vitamins and minerals are not the same thing as we would find in nature in food. You also develop, don't develop toxicity when you get your vitamins and minerals from food. The body knows how to take them apart, assimilate them, and excrete out what it doesn't need. So it's just something that it kind of infuriates me that there's not more companies, especially like dry food companies. That's just like so lazy. They're just all doing the same formulations with the same vitamin and mineral packs and running into the same problems where you can avoid that pretty easily by just using whole food. But whole food's expensive. So there's companies that, you know, do both that I think are super shady where they add in, you know, a bunch of organic fruits and veggies. And then there's a big chunk of vitamins and minerals after that, which just tells you they put that in there in a very small amount to make the consumer think, oh, this is where they're getting all their nutrients. If they were, they wouldn't need to add that chunk of synthetics at the bottom of the recipe. So I just don't think it's necessary. I think that our nutrition should come from food, not a laboratory. I mean, time and time, history has showed us that that doesn't really work out for any living creature. And it's just dogs are simple in terms of their, their GI tract. It's pretty easy to understand where they need to be getting their nutrients from. And to, to overcomplicate it with synthetics that, that stress out their liver and kidneys over the long term, it's just not worth it and just creates more problems in the end. So I just... There's plenty of good companies that don't do it. So I would never need a reason to ever bring in a company that was using a, a vitamin and mineral pack. It's just, it's just stupid to me. Yeah. I heard something the other day and I was trying to remember where I heard it. I think it was Dr. Billinghurst. Um, he said that the most science has been put into feeding humans, dogs, and cats. And the sickest animals on the planet are humans, dogs, and cats. Yep. So I don't, I mean, take that for what you will, but it was, it, it hit me hard. Yeah. I mean, I, I tell people, I'm like, you know, not only is, you know, kibble our garbage, but we already know that the American food supply chain is a nightmare. It is so hard to eat clean food. And now you're going to take the unclean food that we already know is super nasty and then the, all the things that are done to it with kibble is just a nasty concoction and then go like, Yay, good for your dog and wonder why two out of three dogs are getting cancer. Like put the pieces together here. Like it all starts with food. Food is the foundation. That's why I can't help it when I have a customer that has a dog with an issue. The first thing I'm still going to ask is what is your dog eating? I'm not just going to go, oh, let's get you on this, this supplement because it's just not right. Like dogs need to be eating whole real food as much as possible. And there's ways to do it within just about any budget. And we can help people with that. But if you don't start with food, you can never supplement your way to good health. You can't. You can't eat McDonald's every day, take a bunch of supplements and expect to feel better. You just can't. And I mean, I know that firsthand. I took, I take 
handfuls of supplements every day. And it wasn't until I changed my diet that I started to see actual results with my health. So we all know it's there. We all know it's a thing. It's tough because we're all used to, you know, the bagged food, the budget that we all stick to with, with dogs. But it's, it's very ironic considering someone will drop $300 to treat an ear infection, but I ask them to spend $30 a month extra. And that's that some people just can't, can't comprehend that. It's like, okay, well, you're going to end up at the vet for stuff that you could have totally prevented by food. And ear infections are a huge one of those. So it's like, that's not cheap. That's, yeah. that's a, it's just a nightmare to deal with too. If you really, if you have a big dog, oh, good, good God. I can't tell I you how many people will stop having ear issues when they switch their diet. Absolutely. So before we get into supplementation, I know there are a couple of other um, areas generally found in pet stores that I, that are interesting to me. And I'm curious if you have these areas and how you select items for them. Um, that being toys and like collars, leashes, things like that. Do you have any criteria for those? Yes. Um, I do my absolute best to source as much made in the USA um, non-toxic materials is really even more important than made in the USA because there's plenty of stuff we make in the in the US that's still junk. Yeah. Um, but finding companies that use non-toxic materials, um, that's important to me. When, when it comes to toys, you know, I was kind of ambivalent about toys when I first opened the store because I was like, toys are toys, whatever. But the more time goes on here at the store with how much we are focused on health on all aspects, emotional health, physical health, we really focus more towards enrichment toys now. So we have lots of snuffle mats, licky mats, you know, things that engage a dog's mind versus just a plush toy that they rip apart. Now, it's not to say it's not engaging a dog, but generally most owners are frustrated because their dogs are super chewers. And as all super chew dog owners know, there is no indestructible toy. I have the same, same dogs. I mean, I just gave my dog something I got in a sample box and she tore it apart in two seconds. And I was like, okay, I'm glad I didn't actually buy this because this would have been a huge waste of money. So I do actually have a lot of plush toys by a brand called Cycle Dog that don't have squeakies in them. And that seems to actually really help dogs from totally destroying toys because they're trying to get to that squeaker. Um, but when it comes to toys, I mean, really, I think non-toxic materials are super important because this is in your dog's mouth. It's on their gums, which is directly into their bloodstream. So I think it's something a lot of people don't think about, like they just buy a cute toy and yeah, that's fine. But there's, there's a lot of nasty stuff in those, in those fabrics and, and dyes that can do harm long-term, especially to the dog's endocrine system. So finding non-toxic stuff. Um, I like Cycle Dog. I like Soda Pup. I like um, Westpaw. Those are good brands that I think are trying to do the right thing. I really am sad that Westpaw got rid of their, um, their beds because they were like the only non-toxic beds that weren't costing an arm and a leg. Um, that's another thing is like bedding. That's, uh, they're loaded with flame retardants. I mean, I'm as guilty as anybody of buying stuff from TJ Maxx, cute little dog beds because they're cheap. But when I see my dog licking said bed, then you start to like, hmm, what's on that bed? Like there's a lot of icky stuff. So toys and bedding, um, definitely got to look for, for non-toxic stuff as much as possible. Um, when it comes to collars, I tried to do the same thing um, I have a, there's a great brand that actually manufactures in downtown Chicago called Six Point Pet. They're great. Uh, they make really cute little collars. Um, but that's such a ancillary part of my business that, you know, I try to find, you know, smaller companies. Um, you know, there's, there's a great online place called Fair for retailers. It's like kind of a nightmare because you can just shop all day and go crazy, but there's lots of little independent mom and pop type manufacturers you know, doing things with good materials, you know, quality buckles, things that don't just crack and break. So that's where I like to like to find a lot of my stuff is on fair versus the the giant companies out there. I actually tend to buy a lot of those types of things when I'm traveling because I can I like I'll find cute little like local handmade stores and I'm like, yeah. this is so cute. And then I know like this person who's selling it to me made it and it's yeah. Um and there's also a company here in Austin that I got a harness from that I'm like, these are, these are really cute too. And I've never heard of you. Why have I never heard of you? But <laughs> It's tough. I, can, I yeah. like commend these manufacturers. Like, yeah, I'm a store and that's tough, but like building a brand 
from the ground up in, in the level of competition that we have now is really tough. So I'm, I'm like so grateful that these companies continue to exist and I can continue to support them when I actually like meet people face to face and see the people that are making it. That makes such a huge difference. I don't know anybody that wouldn't want to actually know who's making their dog stuff. That's why I love this is because like most of the brands, like honestly, the huge majority of them, I have face to face relationships with these brands. And I love that. That's probably the only reason I go to Super Zoo other than seeing my colleagues is actually to interact with these brands and talk to them and ask them questions instead of just emails and marketing and flashy stuff. So mm -hmm. it goes both ways. Indies should support other independent brands. Oh yeah, absolutely. They, and I, I was really sad to hear that about West Paw too. I probably have like eight of their beds, including some of the old hemp beds. Those things like, I, I was so sad when they stopped making was those. I? And I think I bought out like their catnip when they said they were going to stop making that too, or like, this is like the best catnip out there and you're going to stop making it. Well, there is a really great, and they're still small, such great people um, that make amazing catnip called From the Field. You should check them out. They're awesome. They make, I mean, their prices are reasonable, but they put silver vine in their catnip. Yeah. Um, okay. They just, I, I love them. They're, they're really good people. Um, they're out of blanking Washington. I believe they have their own farms. They grow everything themselves. It's, it's legit. If you want to support a small company, you know, doing things the right way and they make a catnip yeah. spray too. So you can pretty much make any toy, a catnip toy with that stuff. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, okay. So I feel like asking you about supplements is just such, it feels like such a daunting thing. There are so many, it's such a saturated market. It, there's not a whole lot of regulation or oversight, if any, um, unless a company like seeks it out, like with it, is it NASC? I think it is what it is. Yeah. And NASC has its issues too, unfortunately. <laughs> I mean, it's NASC is kind of like AFCO. It's like, well, at least something exists, but right. <laughs> certainly has its issues. I mean, it's still kind of a pay to play organization. Um, you know, I think that some of the things they're testing for, you know, they're not test, they might be testing for safety for sure. I don't deny that they're doing that, but we need to vet these comp companies for potency, for purity, for really making sure that what's in that jar is what is in that jar. Because there's a lot of things where I'm like, this doesn't exactly smell like what you're saying is in here. And these, you know, spices or herbs that are in here should be pretty aromatic. So yeah, the supplement world is becoming more and more muddied because it's, I think it's like the fastest uh, growing sector in the pet industry right now. And, you know, as a retailer, when you go to things like Super Zoo and Global, you can really see what's what's being pushed. And it's just, there's always a phase every year, but definitely the supplement world, the past four or five years has really been the one to be trying to push out more stuff that makes fancy claims and is not all it's cracked up to be. So it's, it's a daunting task for sure. Um, but there's a lot of good stuff out there. There really mm -hmm. is just, it's not going to have the flashy packaging. I mean, there's some companies where I'm like, God, I really wish they'd fix this, this packaging because their, their products are phenomenal, but the packaging is awful, but that's where I come in. That's where I can be like, yeah, here, this one, let me explain it. I know the label looks really wordy and, or it looks awful, but let me actually explain what's in here, why it works, why I know it works. Generally, it's the fact that I've used it on my own dogs. Um, but it, vetting these companies can, can be a hassle in terms of getting somebody to answer your questions immediately, because in my experience, people that can't answer your questions immediately, go back to their marketing department or go back to somebody else where they can come up with an answer for you. And that's pretty much a red flag for me. If you don't know off the bat where these things are coming from, how they're being made, there's an issue there. I'm I'm guessing that most of the people at Nutramax, which is a really popular veterinary supplement company that make things like Cosequin and Dasequin and a million other things, I guarantee they can't tell me where those ingredients are coming from or what even a therapeutic dose of glucosamine is for a dog. That's That's... A huge reason why I got into this is because there is so many fluffy claims where they'll put, oh, it has glucosamine, chondroitin, MSM. How much? How much is in there? Because most of these things don't have therapeutic dosages. They just say the right things and they put a pinch 
And this is why people overpay and are underwhelmed by the results is because these companies are putting a lot of filler and crap in there that's palatable. And a vet, of course, will just, oh, okay, yeah, sure, this is great. You know, it's, it's a joint supplement, whatever. But you're not going to see those results. And I see that time and time again, especially with Cosequin and Dasequin. I get people off of that all the time because I'm like, well, when you put your dog on it, did you see any result? No. Yeah, even if you did the loading dose, you're still not really seeing a great result. Part of it is the, the therapeutic level not being there. But the other big part, which is what really differentiates everything I have in my store, is the inactive ingredients. There is so much junk to make things palatable for dogs. And in most cases, it completely contradicts what the supplement is trying to achieve, which let's be honest, most supplements are trying to achieve some sort of anti-inflammatory effect. If you are putting sugar and honey, molasses, you, I can't eat, there's a million different forms of sugar that they put in these supplements. That is pro-inflammatory. When you put all those things in there, that it's no wonder people aren't seeing results from supplements. Yeah, it might be easy to give in this chew form, but how much is it actually helping your dog and how much is kind of just leaving nasty residue in your dog's gut and liver over the long term? And then you wonder why all these dogs have sludge in their gallbladder and their bile ducts aren't working. And like you, you overwhelm a system with all these nasty synthetic chemicals that a dog was never meant to consume. No wonder we have all these problems. So Supplements, keeping and finding clean supplements is tough because, I mean, I've even seen brands that start out really good and then I look at another bottle and I'm like, when did you put this in here? And then they go out the door. So there, there's great companies out there for sure. I mean, ones that really make it their mission not to have any inactive ingredients or fillers. I love those and plenty of dogs take them, no problem. But it does suck because I really don't carry any chews because I don't carry products um, treats, things like that with glycerin in them, because glycerin is a very ambiguous ingredient for the most part. Most majority of comp companies do not specify what type of glycerin is in their product, which is a huge problem because it can come from some pretty nasty sources. So that makes it really hard for me to carry these, these chews and things like that. But again, usually these clean supplements, you can find ways to get your, your dog or cat to consume them and still have all the benefits without sacrificing that for sugary flavors and dyes. The other thing I absolutely hate is when companies add smoke flavor or just smoked, anything that's smoked. Like we know that's bad for us. Why are we giving those things to our pets? The, it, it, that's just crazy to me sometimes that we're not putting those dots together. Like, hey, I'm not supposed to eat a lot of cooked or charred or smoked meat. Why would I be giving this to my dog? It's just not necessary. There's there's ways to do these things without adding all this junk. And I, I'm, I'm proof positive that there is. I have tons of thriving, wonderful patients and clients doing this the clean way and getting great results. So it's frustrating. It definitely is because when I go to SuperZoo and I'm like, oh, this looks like an awesome supplement. And the you know company's all gung-ho to sell it to me. I turn the bottle around. And I'm like, nope. Can't do it. I don't know why you added this, but I'm not going to sell this in my store. And it sucks, but like I said, there's there's good companies out there. You just have to do a little bit of homework, and that that can be exhausting for for the pet parent. And you know that's why I hope a lot of indies out there that start getting into supplements really start trying to make those tough choices for their customers, so that their customers don't have to go through this supplement graveyard like you were talking about, where we have all these things in our cabinets that don't work because they're usually just a bunch of fluff and not really what they say they are. Yeah. I actually have a really hard time getting my dog to take any chews anyway, because I, you know, constantly getting people like sending me samples and things. And I'm like, well, I'll just see if she likes it. Cause I, I know, I already know at this point, like she's not going to eat it. <laughs> she's just not, if it's not meat, she's not eating it. And um, yeah. Like even some of the ones that I kind of wish she would like coconut or, you know, any, anything that I'm like, this would be really cool if you would just try this. Cause it also has something really good in it for you. Nope. If it's not meat, she's not eating it. Well, and every and, dog's biology is so different. Like something that might work great for another dog. Yeah. That other dog is not going to, it's not going to be so synergistic. So yeah. And I think dogs are smarter than we give them credit for, you know, when there's that whole zoocognopharmacology Mm -hmm. way of thinking where dogs can pick out what's best for them. And I do believe that to be true. Granted, I have a pug that will eat absolutely anything under the sun, but 
still, I think those picky dogs are great, are great testers for telling us like, well, there's something in here that's probably not so savory. Now, of course, there's dogs that are just fussy about everything, <laughs> but yeah. I mean, they're, they're, a, they're a good litmus test of, you know, a, a new treat. If they're just really, mm-mm, don't force it down their throat that you can find something that works. There's, there's a million different alternatives, you know, it, how many different herbs can do the same thing for the kidneys? There's there's ways to get around that and find something that works for your dog. Yeah, it takes a little bit more effort, but you can do it. So when you're looking at a supplement, regardless, and, and we can kind of segment these a little bit if you want, but when you are looking at any sort of supplement, it sounds like, okay, you're looking at what are the active ingredients? What are they saying is going to work? And you want to make sure that that checks out, right? That, that, that what they're using is checking out for what they're saying it's good for. And then you're looking at the inactive ingredients, which I think most people don't do. Um, but is one of like, I really think that's a really important thing to, to reiterate to people too, is that those inactive ingredients are just as important as those side effects on those medications. Absolutely. We, we need to be paying attention to them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm trying to think of like a great, I mean, there's probiotics out there that will claim either a pre and probiotic and their prebiotic is a sugar. Now I'm not talking about FOS, which is, it is a sugar based prebiotic, but there are people that are just using sugary substances to act as a prebiotic. And that's just insane. Like, especially for a dog, a, a, a dog or a cat that's a carnivore. It's very frustrating, <laughs> but that's that's not to say like i said if it would be it would be better to give a weak supplement that's clean than a therapeutic dosage supplement that's got a bunch of junk in it. It, it, it there's there's no two ways about that because things like like maltodextrin is a big is a big problem in my opinion in the supplement world it's something that's added in and considered like generally recognized as safe but you layer on things that are generally recognized as safe that have just a little bit of toxin that becomes no longer safe so these little ingredients that companies will try to justify in one way or another, but you, you do have to go back and be like, is this actually safe? Is this something that my dog should be consuming in a large quantity over a chronic basis? Probably not. Now, am I saying like, if you get like, I have supplements that have glycerin in them. Granted, I know where that glycerin comes from. It's got to be organic vegetable, usually coconut glycerin. But if you give your dog a treat with glycerin, is it going to kill them? No, of course not. But it's that long-term effect of giving just tiny amounts of something that's not so safe or really not biologically appropriate to your dog. And then you wonder why these supplements aren't really achieving a result or you have some other issue further down the road from giving something you thought was safe or helpful. Yeah. And and talking about the sugars, that just drives me up the wall. I, I, I've been racking my brain trying to remember what it was that I was looking at and I for the life of me can't, but it literally had all three of the sugars you listed in it. Like one treat had, or, or I don't remember if it was a treat or a supplement, um, but it had honey, it had molasses and it, and it had palm sugar. Um, um, uh, why can't I think of this word? Anyway, it had all three. And I'm like, why, why are we doing this to our dogs? Well, and the honey, um, well, they'll, that's another deceptive one. Cause you know, people, generally regard honey as this healthy thing. It's not something that we need to be adding into dog treats. Absolutely not. Dogs do not have a sweet tooth. Like that is not what their gut is meant to be consuming. This is something that contributes to disease. We know that. So using those deceptive tactics of like, oh, there's honey in here. Like, please, this is not local honey. This is not Manuka honey. The things that actually have therapeutic value that you're given mm -hmm. at a certain dose. This is just loading up your dogs with sugar. We wonder why they're all so fat. Like, oh uh, yeah, the honey thing that that drives me a little crazy because people will try to justify that. Well, it's honey. Like, it still spikes blood sugar. I'm not, I'm not using that, and I'm not gonna let somebody who has a diabetic dog come in here and buy a tree with honey in it. That's gonna interfere with any progress we're trying to make getting their blood sugar to go down. So, yeah, yeah, that's, that's just one of one of the many. <laughs> there's a there's a bar that a lot of a lot of pet stores carry and the store owners have talked about how good this bar tastes to a person. And that's an immediate red flag. Honestly, the things that taste good to us 
it's probably not a good idea for your dog to be eating for the most. I mean, obviously whole food, that's a different thing. But like mm -hmm. if your dog treat tastes good to you, there's a high chance something's in there that's not so good for your dog. I mean, that, that bar is like, oh, it sounds like crazy. I'm like, yeah, but does it actually work? Does it actually calm yeah. a dog down? We wonder why. I mean, we don't wonder. We know that when you give children cereal and Pop-Tarts and candy, they act crazy. They get hyperactive. But we don't seem to make that connection when we're giving those things to our dogs and wonder why their anxiety is out of control when we're feeding them a sugar-based diet and sugary treats all day long. No wonder they're wired and insane. Like, that's not good for anybody's brain, let alone a dog that's not meant to be eating that in the first place. It's going to totally mess them up. So, yeah, that just gets me a little riled up thinking about that. <laughs> like, it's those wire mouths. It's like, hello, yeah. come on, like, think about this. You know this, this is how it is with people. Why do you think it's that different for your dog? It's not. Mm -hmm. No. I know. Well, even my dog won't even eat fruit. Like I will be eating fruit and try to like offer her a little, no, it doesn't happen. She's like, no, that's oh, not. Oh, my dog's really like hungry. Like the plastic thing open up and they come storming down the stairs. <laughs> my dogs love fruit, but there's good fruit. I mean, they're absolutely there is. Berries are great as long as they're organic. Again, because yeah. our berries are disgustingly loaded with pesticides and mm -hmm. we cannot be giving those things to our dogs. I mean, that's the thing. I actually would rather eat unclean myself than ever give anything unclean to my dogs because dogs don't live long enough. We've already shortened their average lifespan so much by the things that we've done to them, you know, in the food, in the food world, in the medical world. Why would we give them anything that could cut that life short? I wouldn't. My dog is my world. I can't believe he's he's still here and I value every day I have with him. And that's why I make it my whole life to feed him clean food and good things that are going to nourish him and not harm him in the long run. So our pets just don't don't deserve to be fed junk. People, eh, you know, you can make your own choice, but they don't have a choice. They don't have a choice. Right. We love them and we say how much we love them and we value them and we don't want them to leave us. Then make daily choices to help that happen to help their longevity. I mean, that's what Karen and Rodney do every day is try to help people make those little lifestyle adjustments that make a huge impact on their dogs. Dogs age so much more rapidly than we do. And the things that go into their body affect them on such a bigger scale than what it does to us. So it's really important to keep in mind for sure. So you kind of, I think, mentioned it um, with supplements, but sourcing is just as important. The, the raw ingredients going into a supplement, that sourcing is just as important as what we're putting in our food, I think. And I think you think that too. Um, so again, I just want to reiterate, having having a relationship with where whoever it is, if you're going to an indie pet store or if, if you are trusting recommendations from somebody, um, like having that relationship to be able to ask questions, to know that the person you are trusting to, to source, whether it's food or supplements or anything you're buying for your pets, like that you trust them and that they have the knowledge, that they have the um, information behind it to say, yes, I feel confident that this is going to be okay for your pet. And I, 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 to add to that, I think it's a, when from, for someone who's like not coming to my store, if you're going to your indie pet store and they don't admit if they don't know something, that's probably a, a bad sign. It is important to ask questions. If I don't know the answer to a question that my customer asked me, I will do my damnedest to find out the answer, but I'm not going to be, I don't want to say lying because I don't want to call people liars that do this, but like making up an answer or just saying, yeah, yeah. it's good really do the work to figure this out. And yeah, it does take time, but that's why you're in this industry, right? Like if you're, if you're a pet store owner, this is your job. This is, you should have the answers if you're going to carry a product and stand behind it. So sometimes you don't know all the answers, but that's where building that relationship with your customer is so important is because they'll ask you those things that you might not have thought to ask a manufacturer. And that can build what you ask the next manufacturer that brings something in or wants to bring something into your store. There's plenty of questions I didn't ask five years ago that I ask now because I've learned from either my customers or, you know, something I read. It's important to have those meaningful conversations with customers. Take your time, talk to them, get to know them, understand things, because that's where things kind of go wrong is if you act like a know-it-all and just kind of 
roll over people with information, let them ask questions, have a dialogue. You might not know everything, but that's what understanding is all about is, is, you know, taking in that and going, I'm going to figure this out for you. And then you learn better and you all do. There is one, um, I get, I don't, for lack of a better word, like class of supplement that I'm curious, uh, what you are looking for in the supplement. And that is bioaccumulators. I think there's something different that most people don't realize are different that they need to be asking different questions about. Um, and for me, like a bioaccumulator being like a hemp plant or mushroom, these are things that when where, wherever they are being grown, whatever is in that soil, whatever is in that environment, that plant or that fungi like soaks it up. Um, so what are you looking for differently in supplements that have bioaccumulators that you may not have thought of previously now that these are like becoming more popular? And yeah, it, it absolutely has happened to me, um, especially with medicinal mushrooms. I, I think that that sector of the supplement world is growing at an insane pace. Um, fortunately, because of one of my jobs, I, I, I researched this heavily. And I, I went through, um, I think I interviewed like probably two dozen different of the, like the most popular medicinal mushroom companies, um, asking them where they source their mushrooms, how they're grown, um, how they're extracted, whether they are extracted or not. And I was pretty shocked at, at, in terms of what I found, because some of these companies legitimately did not even know where the mushroom was coming from. One of them gave me a sheet that said country of origin and capitalized the word unknown. Yeah, legitimately, I was like, I can't believe you're actually giving this to a consumer and expecting them to just go, oh, okay. Yeah. But like you said, bioaccumulators absorb whatever is in their environment. Uh, a great example is the fact that they're growing marijuana plants um, in Chernobyl to get rid of the radioactive mm -hmm. soil. It, it pulls everything out. So you do have to be very careful. Um, I only... I only really carry one brand of hemp extract um, and the owner is insane in a really good way about making sure that her, her crops are organic, which that's by the farm bill. So that's like, there's these marketing claims that are made where it's like, well, that's the law. So you're not really doing anything special, but you do have to be really sure about where you're getting these things. And I think a lot of these companies, especially when it comes to CBD oil, most of them are getting them from the same place. And depending on how that is extracted, that can also result in residual pesticides, um, toxins, heavy metals. That is why COAs are so important in the hemp industry. And it's something that needs to be prioritized in the medicinal mushroom industry. Absolutely. Because these are becoming so popular and medicinal mushrooms can be grown on a variety of substrates. So like substrate is like the medium on which they're grown on. Hemp plants, not so much. Yeah, you can do like aquaponic stuff, but that's that's not, you know, a log, for example. Mushrooms should generally be grown, depending on the type of mushroom, let's just say, um, on a dead birch tree in the woods. It is important for these things not only to be grown in a clean environment, so like clean forests that aren't, you know, in, in areas that are full of pollution like China, um, but it's really important to consider the amount of what they're taking out of that substrate. There is legitimate studies showing that mushrooms that are wild harvested have way more, um, not just beta glucans, but all the other amazing medicinal compounds of medicinal mushrooms compared to something that's grown on a sawdust log. Not to mention sawdust logs are usually sawdust from a mill and usually mills have treated lumber. The, to, in order to dry out the wood, to get it ready to cut, there are chemical processes that these this wood goes through. So that's still in the sawdust. And so we're putting that all together and then having a mushroom grow out of that. Now, what is that mushroom really going to contain? It probably contains some of those pesticides. And it's very hard because there's really no standardized testing when it comes to mushrooms. Um, one of the mushroom companies I carry uh, sent their mushrooms to four different laboratories, the same sample to four different laboratories and got dramatically different results from every single laboratory. So this is a problem with, with mushrooms. And I think it's 
it's kind of beautiful in a way because it shows you just how complex mushrooms are. They are not something that they're not like anything else. They're really their, their own class of organism. They're, I mean, yeah, some people call them a fungi, but the more research that's done, they are an incredible thing. So trying to standardize tests, such an incredible thing with so many weird properties to it that we're just beginning to understand creates a problem in the supplement industry, obviously. And so it makes it so people can really just kind of do whatever the hell they want with mushrooms. There are companies that have mushroom powders that are just raw ground up mushrooms where basically that cell wall is not broken down enough to get any of those medicinal compounds out. We know that mushrooms have to be processed in certain ways, either by alcohol, water, both burning. There's, there's all sorts of ways to get these compounds out. So just grinding up a mushroom, that's a good fiber source, perhaps a good prebiotic, but it's not going to do a whole lot medicinally for your dog. And trying to decipher that on a label is extremely hard. It's, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's one of the things when I asked these companies, I couldn't tell whether they had a mushroom extract powder or whether this was just mushroom powder. And I guarantee most people that are buying these things, especially off like Amazon and Chewy, and they're not, they're not looking into that. They're going, oh, mushrooms. They said it does this. They said it's going to get rid of my dog's giant tumor. I just saw an ad on Facebook about that. It was like, oh, it's full of beta glucans. And I looked at the label. I'm like, this is such junk. This is just really unfortunate. People are giving this to their, their pets. And like you said, this is, this is an issue when we're dealing with things that absorb toxins from our environment. So people will go both ways. Like, oh, if you get in the wild, well, you don't know what you're getting, but yeah, you do. Cause it's not just from anywhere in the wild. These are select regions or you can grow it in a greenhouse where, yeah, it might have less contaminants, but it's also not going to be nearly as medicinally powerful as something grown in the wild because Plants in general, any damaged plant you get, which is why like misfit produce is actually a really great thing. Those plants actually generally have more phytonutrients than your standard pretty plants you get in the grocery store. Because things that are exposed to hardship in nature develop more compounds to protect themselves. And those same compounds are the same compounds that help us nutritionally and medicinally. So buying things that are grown in nature might be a little bit damaged or dented is actually a really good thing. But when it comes to bioaccumulators, I mean, hopefully in a few years, things are better in terms of standardized testing. But if your company does not give you a certificate of analysis, just turn the other direction, ask for your money back, don't buy it. It's not going to be a good thing because they're that's, that's something that is absolutely critical for every supplement company to be doing is verifying what is in their, their product and to make sure that it's a clean product, especially when it comes to those bioaccumulators for sure. I'm not a huge fan of uh, regulation or government overreach or any of that, but I do think that we need some standards for some things because marketing is out of control. Yeah. And I really kind of wish as you were, it just hit me as you were talking about that. I kind of wish we had something similar for essential oils because there's so much crap on the market. Yeah. And essential oils have gotten a really bad name, especially in the pet industry for that reason is because people are buying stuff off Amazon and I've gotten counterfeit stuff from Amazon. It's a huge reason why I'm so passionately against people buying supplements from Amazon, but there have been dogs that have died from that. And then it makes people go, Oh, well, you know, blah, blah, blah. Peppermint is toxic to dogs. No, crappy peppermint oil that's grossly misused is toxic to dogs. But you can say that with just about anything that's crappily made and used the wrong way. That's probably going to cause some damage. So yeah, the, the essential oil industry, that's a really tough one. I, I mean, I, I trust who I trust because I actually know that person. And that's, that means a lot, but for the average consumer, I don't think they're going to really be able to be in contact with the manufacturer themselves and really be able to vet them. So again, that's why it's important to go to your indie pet store that probably does have a relationship with this brand and actually can give you the straight, the straight shit about it, basically. Um, well, I very much appreciate your time and your knowledge, and I just have one more question, if you don't mind. Um, I am one of those people that is very weirdly passionate about finding products that I can not only use for my dog, but for my cat and for me as well. And I'm wondering, because with the name like Pug and Hound, that makes me think 
you're catering to dogs, but I know you also have a cat section. Yes. So how do you kind of, how do you, how do you manage that within having stuff for cats, stuff for dogs? Do you like things that overlap? How does that work for you? So that's kind of the beauty and it, it kind of just happened on accident by the standards that I, that I have for what's in my store. Cause I don't allow grains, glutens, dyes, sugars, artificial flavoring, salts, preservatives, any of that. So it eliminates all of the things that probably would not be suitable for dog or for cats. So my store is really, I'd say like 99% dog and cat inclusive. Most of the cat stuff just comes in smaller serving sizes. Um, and the cat food usually has, has less fruit and veg in it because cats don't need that much. Um, but really the majority of my store caters to both species. I, 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 in some ways regret being called pug and hound because people are like, oh, I assume you don't have anything for cats. I'm like, no, everywhere you look is something for a cat. There's very few things that are not suitable for cats in my store. And I would never allow a cat owner to buy them. I would tell them that like, um, great example is there's a CBD salve that contains peppermint and eucalyptus and it's not suitable for cats. That is something that my whole staff knows. This is not something we would ever recommend to a cat customer, but considering most of my treats are just body parts, cats love that. Cats love rabbit ears and rabbit feet and chicken feet. Yeah, they're big. They take them a longer time, but almost everything in here is catered to both. Of course, I do have supplements that are specific to cats, like uh, the two crazy cat ladies make a wonderful line of supplements. But that's not to say I haven't actually sold some of those supplements for dogs because their supplements do do both things. But as a lot of cat people probably understand, you like to see something that says it's for a cat. So it does require somewhat of a conversation when people are like, well, this can't be good for a cat, right? No, it actually is. Please feed your cat a tiny little marrow bone. Cats love that. I used to, we uh, fostered cats at a pet store I worked in like a decade ago. And we would always give them little raw bones. Cats love that. They're little carnivores. They love that stuff. They love the rabbit ears. So absolutely, pretty much the entire store is is catered to both dogs and cats. Yeah, I am I think I'm one of the, the weird, random people that I just, I don't care if it has a dog or a cat on the front of it. Like I look at the ingredients, I look at the label, I'm, and I know that it's okay for my dog or it's okay for my cat or both. Yeah. And I absolutely, I use the two crazy cat ladies or feline essentials for my cats, for my dog and for me. <laughs> yeah, they make wonderful stuff. I've used OxyCat for myself. Yeah. I've used OxyCat for Bruce. I've used the Urinary Cat Plus for Bruce. Mm -hmm. They make amazing stuff and it's super clean, like yeah. perfectly clean. They are a great example of a company that doesn't add any junk. It's amazing. Like, I wish, I wish more companies would do that. It's, it's a tough yeah. thing to do, I'm sure, because you want to sell and you want to make money and support your life. But mm -hmm. at, at what consequence if, you know, things aren't working or could possibly be harming a pet? Yeah. Well, um, again, I want to thank you so much for your time and for your knowledge and for sharing it with people. Um, there's, again, I, I said it earlier, there's so much like conflicting information online and on social media. And any time we can start to like really hone in, narrow down our focus and realize that everything around us is marketing and we have to be diligent about cutting through the marketing and actually looking at what that product is before we buy it. I think that's in, in not to say like, if you buy a product and you try it and it doesn't work, like we've all been there. There's nothing wrong with you. <laughs> like you're so not a failure. <laughs> We've all been there. Um, but we, as long as we learn from that and do better the next time, that's that's the important part. And to um, please find, if you have, I don't know where you live, um, but if you have an independent pet store around you, please find them and make friends with them because they are going to be like some of the best sources of information for you to help your pets thrive and Krista, thank you so much for being here. Do you have anything? To, well, but yes, please tell people where to find you online so they can find you and like follow you and do all the things. But if you have any like parting words. Um, I would just say I, I know that a lot of people get their heartstrings tugged on when it comes to some of this marketing. So try to take a step back when you see that type of stuff and let your brain do the thinking, whether this is a, a good idea for you or not. But 
Um, I think that's kind of where I come in because I've definitely been duped before by like, oh my God, this video, this is such a dramatic turnaround. Like, eh, let's, let's, let's take a step back and actually, actually look at things for what they are. Um, in terms of my store, um, like I said, I'm 45 minutes west of downtown Chicago in Geneva, Illinois. Um, our website is pugandhound.com, uh, Pug and Hound Apothecary. We're on Facebook, Instagram. Um, you can call us or text us at our store number. Um, we're very accessible to all of our customers, no matter where you are. Um, we make that very clear because we're kind of in a touristy town, so we get a lot of out-of-towners. So I'm always happy to help from near or far. I do do um, personalized health consultations where I go over everything from food, treats, diet, environment, you name it. Um, spend 100% of my time dedicated to you in that, in that time frame. So I'm happy to do that for anyone who's interested as well. Oh, that's awesome. That's a wonderful resource. Thank you for mentioning it. And um, guys, y'all have a great rest of your week. Um, again, I think this is a, a bookmarkable episode. Come back to it, make some notes, test out, test out all of the um, information Krista gave you on the food and supplements, treats, everything that's already in your pantry or your freezer or your refrigerator and see um, if it matches what you actually want to be putting into your pet and and start making some decisions from there. So again, thank you so much, Krista. Thank you. Um, have a wonderful rest of your week. Please give your pets some extra love from me and from Krista this week. And I will talk to you next week.